everyone, and thank you for joining us to the, for the, sorry, uh, how are providers coping with uh, COVID-19 and the recession, recent Alliance surveys and interviews. Um, I'm just going to ask if you can hear me, can you just put something in the chat box to, uh, or the, the, yeah, in the chat to let us know that the audio is coming through okay? Yep, okay, great. So with that, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of housekeeping notices um, before we get fully started. Everyone is on mute. Um, the uh, chat function actually hasn't been disabled for uh, this webinar, so you can uh, chat and share your ideas. And you know, if you have um, questions, we prefer that you use the questions box for that so we can do a Q&A session. Um, so, but for chatting, you know, by all means, if you'd like to chat with each other, enjoy. Um, so we do have a COVID-19 webinar series uh, that is available on our website at the link that's on the screen. Uh, there's a ton of really, really good info about uh, providing homeless services during COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I, I really encourage you to take a look. Uh, we've put a lot of work into uh, providing as much information as we can to providers. So um, you know, when you have a, a chance and if you are looking to learn more about uh, ways to deal with COVID-19 and homelessness, that is available to you, as well as the Ending Homelessness Forum. Um, that is a great place for people to come and share ideas and uh, ask questions and engage in conversation. Um, and then, of course, uh, as always with all of our webinars, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to all attendees. Uh, along with the slides, and we will be um, uh, posting it on our website as well. And joining the call today, we have um, myself, Jackie Janosko, um, but uh, presenting on the call today is Joy Moses, the Director of the Homelessness Research Institute here at the Alliance, uh, Eric Rice, the Director of the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence in um, in social work, right? Or in society, I'm sorry, my screen was covered. Um, and Dan Treglia from the University of Pennsylvania's um, School of Policy and Practice. And as I said, I'm here uh, just kicking things off for everyone. And with that, I will let you know the agenda for this webinar is um, pretty straightforward. We're gonna give you an overview of the project, talk about the conversations we've had with providers when we did some in-depth interviews, then we're going to look at the survey results from the first round of surveying in the spring. And then we're going to look at uh, the results when we did a follow-up survey later in the summer. And then we're gonna open it up for questions and answers. Um, and we'll have some questions for you and I hope you have some questions for us. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. And with that, I am going to change over to uh, Joy Moses, who will uh, start the first section. And Joy, you should be good to go for sharing your screen. Um, sorry about that, just a moment. There we go. Thank you all for joining us today. We definitely appreciate um, the speakers being here um, and all of our various, um, all of the various people participating um, by uh, viewing this webinar. So please um, just have, just give a little bit of patience for me in um, getting this set up. Um, as Jackie mentioned, my name is Joy Moses. I work with the Homelessness Research Institute um, at the Alliance. And I just wanted to give you some background on this project that we started um, with the, um, close to the beginning of the, um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of some, a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh, so I'm just going to um, give you some background information um, about uh, this project. So I'm just going to ask you to ignore this video that's appearing on the right side of my screen. I'm not quite sure why that is there. 
um, but it's not a part of my presentation. So I'm just going to start off. Um, so we at the Alliance were definitely noting that these were some unprecedented times. It was this is um, certainly an unusual health and economic crisis coming together in one. Um, and we had various reasons to, um, to examine the issues, uh, to examine these issues um, in our work with, uh, with, from various aspects of our work. Um, the first aspect was we wanted to be able to provide our audience and our, the people who, um, who follow our work with some technical assistance when needed. Um, we also do some advocacy work. So um, we needed to know uh, the needs of communities and the needs of homeless, um, uh, home, people experiencing homelessness when we go up to the Hill and when we talk to administrative agencies about what they should be doing to, um, in response to the crisis. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was to identify some promising practices that could be used for a number of reasons. One of them is that we're in an evolving crisis. And that means that um, some communities would be experiencing some things um, at early points, earlier points in time than others. So um, anything we could find out from the early, um, ex the early experiences could inform later folks. Um, also, evolving means that even as, um, as one particular community feels or is in a place where they might be on the, on the downslope of the crisis, um, it could, it could reemerge and they could be going through a similar cycle of, um, a similar cycle that they had gone through before again. So, um, we could have some communities that were hot spots and then didn't become, and then um, reduce their numbers and then um, had those numbers go up again. So um, given that, we wanted to know what was working or what seemed to be working or some of the good things that people were doing so that later folks could learn from it and um, be able to make decisions accordingly. We also wanted there to be some accurate information sharing it essentially, um, we know that a lot of people will hear things and um, there'll be rumors, but we wanted to have some sort of basis for being able to um, say what a lot of communities were doing and what actually was happening. So here's how we went about um, getting this information from a lot of you and other folks in the field. Um, we decided to have a series of First, um, phone interviews with um, different COC representatives. And those went over a couple of month period, um, roughly in May and June of this year, of course. Um, and then we also had a series of surveys. So we did an initial survey that we like to point out that was um, conducted by one of our colleagues, Sharon McDonald, which was, um, which was in March of 2020. And then the group that you're gonna hear from today um, got together and we started um, a, another form of survey, the first of which was in May of 2020 and the second was in July of 2020. So um, there, so I'm gonna give some basics of what that is. Um, the, I'm going to give some basics of the interview portion of the uh, project. So basically, we had um, various Alliance staffers who had volunteered to help with this process. They agreed to make some calls and talk to some of you and some of your colleagues. Um, essentially, we were able to contact people from 24 different COCs. Um, and they tended to represent a diversity of ge geographic regions and community types. We started off with a list that was, um, that ensured that diversity, um, and many of you responded, um, some didn't, but we ended up with, um, with a group that still maintains the diversity that we were seeking. Basically, um, some big major points from our findings were um, in talking to 
a lot of a lot of these folks, we realize that so many of you, um, in hearing your voices, you are working hard to serve people experiencing homelessness. Um, we heard stories about outreach workers who were still going out and trying to help people, even if they didn't have um, uh, the PPE that 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 um, that they would have liked to have had. Um, we heard about system leaders who were exhausting all different types of options to figure out how they could get funding for the people they serve and all types of other um, workers, volunteers in between. So we were excited to hear those stories. Um, we heard about some of the promising things that people were thinking of, including a lot of creative approaches um, that um, are, are informing this presentation today. But of course, um, given the times and the significance of the, uh, the actual crisis, we heard about a lot of challenges that we also want to discuss. So um, one of the ways that uh, we thought we could divide this information was to just talk about the, what, the various approaches to ensuring that, that clients and um, workers were, were in healthy conditions. So we heard about um, agencies um, co-locating testing and health services where um, people experiencing homelessness live and congregate. Um, testing was not always um, universally available uh, and quite often wasn't, but there are communities that um, engage in some randomized testing uh, of, of, of a small bit of their population to determine and make estimates for the wider population. Um, there were folks who were implementing alert systems so that after the testing was done, they could reach out to um, the folks who were tested and give them their test results, but also share um, health announcements with them. There was various forms of triage happening. Um, the, some of the better forms of that included healthcare professionals. There were partners, um, partnerships that were developed between healthcare for the homeless or um, a local hospital or a local healthcare center where um, those um, where volunteers from those types of agencies were were interviewing and checking clients to make sure um, what their health condition was in order to make a decision about where, where their temporary housing and placement should be. Um, we heard about people providing transportation to testing sites um, or to the new temporary forms of housing. Um, there were a lot of efforts in different ways to improve sanitation at unsheltered locations or to expand access to PPE. Um, and of course, a big focus of the work in this space is to do housing placements for clients. A big part of that was the CDC recommendations, like keeping um, beds six feet apart. Um, a lot of people reported doing that, even if it was difficult at the start, but they were able to um, successfully um, meet, uh, meet those recommendations. Um, we heard about people opening, um, keeping winter shelters open during the spring and summer so that they could continue to expand the number of beds they were able to offer. Um, there were new auxiliary shelters and, and places um, available in the community, including recreation centers and convention centers. New safety precautions were taken. Um, we heard about bed guards and um, um, replacing congregate meal settings with grab and go meals. And another big solution was um, extending hours so that um, that um, shelters were open beyond the nighttime hours and people could stay there during the day and um, more effectively isolate in that way. But probably one of the biggest things we heard and that probably comes as no surprise to most of the people on this call is that there were big efforts to place people in hotels and motels. Um, and that that was a good way to ensure um, quarantine for, the, for those who were sick or isolation for those who were particularly vulnerable. Um, to get to that, 
place a number of communities already had hotel motel programs but they may have modified rules about um, who could enter who could stay in order to be more flexible um, and allow more people to take advantage of those options during during a health crisis when it, it was most needed um, of course uh, there was some prioritization of the um, populations that the CDC said were most at risk of becoming seriously ill, specifically older adults and people with pre-existing medical conditions. But we heard from some communities that were also um, doing a lot of targeting to unsheltered people and families. Um, various things happened around staffing. Um, some, some communities clearly were able to staff up, up quickly. Some, it, it took a little bit longer but they were telling us about different um, types of employees that they, that they needed at these new sites, not only to, um, to keep them functioning and keep them um, going, but to also help clients with um, needs related to housing and health. And they were making big, um, they were, a lot of them were thinking about what they were going to do once people exited from these locations and how they could specifically get a lot of people who were vulnerable, um, extremely vulnerable, older, um, sickly, so forth into permanent housing. Uh, beyond that, though, we heard about other types of creative solutions for the communities that um, wanted to, to do more than hotels or motels or where that wasn't so much an option. Um, so some of them were, for instance, um, setting up temporary um, beds or temporary isolation um, pods in, in state parks, or they were using RVs in a campground. Um, those were some of the examples we heard. And then for, for places where there were still um, and are still encampments, um, sanctioning became a good option, um, as well as um, providing them with greater supplies and um, items like hand washing stations. We ended up talking to a lot of people about staffing concerns, uh, both related to um, increasing uh, needs, but also um, shortages. Uh, and they were doing some pretty creative things to, to manage um, those issues. Um, obviously, everybody was reallocating responsibilities where needed. So um, various people had new responsibilities that they didn't have before, and they were making it work. Other things that were happening were hiring and borrowing workers from other agencies. So some other agencies um, may have been in a in a place where they needed to, or it was um, they were were wanting to lay off workers, or um, they had workers who had job duties that were not as active during the crisis, and they were able to shift people around between agencies. Some places talked about hiring temporary workers, but one of the things um, that we honed in on is the, the various ways that people were trying to. Um, maintain the staff that they had um, prior to the crisis uh, and in doing that they were trying to do things like um, increase the safety um, and improve safety measures to make people feel more secure in their working environment um, that might mean alternative schedules that kept um, that allow people to spend some time at home and some time at work um, and in an environment where there was less um, less people working and less people um, um, sharing the same spaces um, during this time. Um, we also heard of them, of course, keeping high-risk staff, older workers or, or workers who um, had pre-existing conditions or who are caretakers for such people, um, allowing them to stay off more and making those judgment calls as well. Um, we heard about financial incentives, um, hazard pay for, for um, people who were particularly frontline workers and shelters or outreach and also providing bonuses and incentives for people who were who exhibited good attendance. So I, I just wanted to highlight some of those things. Um, I'll mention a few more, but I, I do want to transition into the presentations of the other speakers. Um, we particularly like to stress 
the, um, the good data collection work that was going on. It helps, um, not only does it help us understand issues, but it is useful for communities um, and trying to figure out how to manage the crisis, manage where um, people should be staying and um, where services are needed. So um, we heard about people um, quickly adjusting their HMIS systems um, and doing trainings for employees. And there were all types of partnerships going on to ensure testing and the delivery of services. Before I close, I'll just highlight a couple of challenges that existed that generally fall that generally fall into some major categories. One of them, of course, um, which is a, a, um, a typical thing throughout all of our work, is resource constraints. So um, there were a number of areas that people had needs, but they at the time did not have the resources for them and they still not, um, they needed more staff, for instance, for hotels and motels. They, they wanted to place some, they wanted to have a place to place people um, after they exited from isolation. Um, they wanted to ensure more testing and, and, great, and, and improved health conditions. There were other challenges that uh, we, we labeled as organizational growing pains or just things that just had to be done um, that were new, that hadn't really been done before, or had to, if they had been done before, they had to suddenly be do, done quickly, which is setting up new locations, um, uh, setting up um, new staffers, um, managing people in general and all of their uh, concerns, including staffers who had, um, who definitely had uh, new worries and new um, issues that they were bringing to the table. And then there were certain areas where people just were requesting a lot of guidance about things like how to manage the flow of people through systems. So um, I'm gonna close there and um, shift to our next speaker. Um, as I mentioned, we um, began working with um, partners on this project and I'm excited to hear what they have to say, um, starting with um, Eric Rice. Hi, folks. I'm going to try to make this work properly. Um, we'll see if that works. Okay, I think that I'm getting things going. Uh, I always like to make some sort of joke about that. I run a Center for Artificial Intelligence, but I can't make uh, simple things like Zoom and PowerPoint work. So um, I guess I should make some requests that if uh, maybe somebody could just throw into the into the chat real fast, whether or not I'm, I'm, I'm audible and I'm going to assume that, that I probably am. So, um, okay, I'm going to attempt to add to this conversation um, some of the quantitative context. And why might that be good? Well, primarily because what, what, um, what Joy has been able to share with us is um, a really good set of insights about what the variety of strategies that were going on were and really what the quantitative survey is going to be able to show us is really to what extent were communities across the country enacting those particular solutions. How common were they is really what we can get at. When we did this survey, we covered a huge array of topics which are listed here. I won't read them all off, but I'll highlight a couple uh, things like PPE issues for consumers and staff, the impact on staffing, um, new housing placements to address COVID-19, many of the issues which uh, Joy previously uh, discussed. So um, the, let's see, again, make this work. Yes, okay. How, what did we do? Well, we sent out a survey on April 23rd which closed on May 8th. So for two weeks, um, and let me just remind you all of when this was. So shelter in place in most communities started in mid-March, around March 15th is when it happened in California. We were one of the first. And this really represents what was happening for the first six weeks of the response to the pandemic. So if some of this seems particularly dire or really um, 
uh, grim in some of what the statistics look like. Remember that this is early, early days of the response. And you can certainly see over time, which Dan will get into next, the, the sort of the strength and the resilience of the communities um, in their response to this epidemic and how to address issues of homelessness uh, for our communities. So what we did was we went to the grantee contact page, we, um, the, the folks from the Alliance did, uh, Dan and Dennis Colhane, who's also part of this team and, and myself were really the lucky recipients of, of the data and got to just look at the data and help uh, uh, compile and think through and, and write the reports with the, with the Alliance, but they really deserve all the credit for the hard work and the heavy lifting. So what happened was that all 397 COCs across the country that HUD funds were invited to participate. 168 of those COCs actually participated and approximately half of those respondents completed the survey. So we feel given that this was a, an email solicitation that our responses are really quite high and reflect how important people think these, these issues are. Okay, I'm gonna share with you six slides. They're all fairly dense. They all appear in our PDF report. So if you want to see in more detail these results, they are available and have been available for a couple of months now. But I'm gonna highlight on each of these slides a couple of key facts that I think are important. So this first slide was uh, reporting out who it was that was being screened and tested for COVID in the context of uh, the housing systems in these first in the first month and a half and one of the things that i want you to notice is that in this first uh, box here 84 percent of the communities that we surveyed said that they were screening all people who are going into a shelter which is great but remember this was also early days so testing was not widely available or, or barely available in some cases so what you see here when we look at who is being tested for covid19 that in some instances, so for example, here with this 14% number, if someone tested positive in a shelter, only 14% of the communities who responded said that they had the capacity to test everyone in that shelter to see if the disease was spreading amongst in the shelter. And likewise, only 21% had the, had the capacity to even test those who were symptomatic at that time. So while screening was high, testing was, was, was relatively lower and, and in some cases was, was very um, problematic. Now, if we move to this next slide, what this shows is you know, prevention measures that were being implemented. And, and Joy discussed a whole host of prevention measures, but this again provides you with some context about how prevalent were those uh, particular measures. So, Notice here in the first half, first part of this slide that 92% of the communities that we surveyed had implemented social distancing in their emergency shelters, which is fantastic. So that was a widespread, almost universal response. There were, however, a, a, a minority, but, but you know, almost one fifth of the communities that we surveyed says that they closed their emergency shelters in response to COVID-19. So these are two very different responses, right? Um, then if we think, if we go down to the next uh, panel here of this slide and we think about what was it that uh, there was new resources that were being implemented for people who were, uh, who were uh, unsheltered, what you can see is that one of the big responses was procuring new hotel rooms for the unsheltered and in the and in and in the uh, in the part of the table just above notice 83 percent of the communities were also procuring new hotel and motel rooms for people who are in shelter so this is really s distancing the beds in shelters and then finding hotels and motels was a nearly universal almost immediate response by most all communities which really reflects, I think, the resilience of, you know, and, and, and sort of the, the scrappiness of these communities, given how you know, resource constraints impact almost everyone who, who is dealing with, um, you know, trying to house uh, people experiencing homelessness. Now, um, one of the other things to notice, though, is that with many communities, the, the, the use of these hotels was really, at least early on, to try to address people who were diagnosed or who were symptomatic. 
right? So remember, um, in early days, not necessarily were all communities able to get uh, access to testing. There was a big delay in getting testing rolled out in our country. Um, and so you see, you see that uh, reflected in these data. Now, how many beds were added? What we see here is that there were really across these, um, uh, these communities, and we can see that by the time we get to here, we only had about 90 communities, which is about 25% of the COCs responding to um, the survey, and that those 90 communities account for approximately 7,000 new motel and hotel rooms. We also see that congregate shelters were, were you know, in the thousands. And we also see that you know, permanent supportive housing is in the thousands. So really, you know, the scale of the response was, is, is pretty dramatic, I think. Now, this is something which uh, Joyce spent a fair amount of time discussing, which was some of the challenges that were experienced uh, by communities with respect to staff. And I think what's really important to, to notice here in this response in the first six weeks to the pandemic is that communities were hit pretty hard. Um, almost everyone was reporting issues. So 60% of the communities report, who, who were surveyed said that they were experiencing staffing shortages. Of those who were experiencing the staffing shortages, when asked what were those staffing shortages, 90% of them said that frontline shelter staff were in short supply. 60% said that street outreach workers, and 63% said that volunteers, and almost half said that they're social workers. So we have huge shortages across the board, especially in frontline staff and volunteers. And then when asked why that was happening, what were the reasons for these shortages, what you see here is that volunteers were absent due to quarantines and social distancing and social and social distancing. So in some cases, in some communities, volunteers were not allowed even to participate. Um, and then paid staff were also absent due to social distancing and social isolation and quarantine and health issues. And as Joy had suggested toward the end of her presentation, you know, this was a very stressful and continues to be a very stressful time for uh, many of us who are, who are, especially those working on the front line. And so what you see here is that of the folks who are facing these staffing challenges, 90% almost said that they were suffering from exhaustion due to long hours and increased responsibilities that were uh, because of the, the, the pandemic. And 90% had uh, increased stress due to fears of contracting COVID-19 at work. Now, if we turn to issues of PPE, this is also reflective, particularly of what was happening in the first month and a half. It may be hard for some of us to remember that toilet paper and hand sanitizer and masks were almost impossible to get for the first month, month and a half of the pandemic. But if you look at these slides, that reality is reflected very, very strongly in what was happening uh, for the community responses, right? 70% of the communities who answered the survey said that they couldn't get hand sanitizer. 69% uh, said that they didn't have enough access to COVID-19 tests. 76% said that they didn't have masks for all their consumers. And when asked why that was happening, the universal response essentially was that these things were just not available, right? 88% said that there were not enough supplies available for purchase. It was just not you know, possible to get, get your hands on these, uh, these things when you needed them. The last slide that I am going to share and to provide some context here and before turning things over to Dan to talk about how things changed by July is to look at what the prioritization for resources was in, um, in late April, early May. Now, this slide is a, little, is a little wonky, I'll say, right? So people were asked to rank order their um, issues. So it, how are resources being used on new shelters, on motels, hotels, on PPE, staff, encampment resources, etc. And to rank what was number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And so what this box here says is that 51% of the communities responding said that the number one resource allocation that was going on during the six-week period was towards hotels and motels. And then 
25% of the communities said that that was number two. So essentially 75% of the communities responding said that hotels and motels were either the number one or number two resource allocation priority. The second most endorsed uh, number one resource allocation was permanent housing, right? So while this temporary motel hotel prioritization was extremely important, we also saw that communities were continuing to prioritize uh, permanent supportive housing. Interestingly, number three uh, that was highly endorsed, uh, you know, 35% of the respondents endorsed as number three, PPE. So while PPE shortages were almost universally uh, discussed, that was not the number one thing that money was being spent on. It was really resources were being spent on hotels and motels first. Then we're talking about, you know, issues around PSH. We're also talking issues around uh, staffing. And then you notice that there's also, a, you know, that the, fairly consistently in the lower regions were, you know, resources for encampments and new shelter spaces. These were, these were, the, um, these were the issues that were being prioritized less um, relative to these other issues. And I think with that, I will stop and certainly try to leave some time for folks to uh, ask me some questions. I'm going to stop sharing so that Dan can take over. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, uh, I'm going to presume that you can see my screen unless somebody tells me otherwise. Um, hi everyone, my name is Dan Treglia. Uh, I am faculty at the University of Pennsylvania um, and I'm doing kind of the, the follow-up piece of this. Um, so Joy laid out some kind of overall findings and some, some lessons learned from the qualitative piece of, of this project. Um, Eric went through part one and so I'll go through uh, part two and here's what we'll talk about today. Um, is we'll talk about the survey that we conducted over the over the summer uh, at the end of July. We'll talk about kind of how we did it, um, what kind of response rate we got, um, and then what we learned in terms of a few different categories. Screening and uh, testing of clients for COVID-19, the availability and constraints around PPE, um, the ability to place uh, consumers into temporary and um, permanent housing options um, and what the limitations were there. Um, what kind of data were collected um, related, just generally specifically related to COVID-19. Um, questions about the impact of COVID-19 on overall system functioning, uh, generally focused on uh, staff and volunteer shortages. And then finally, we'll talk about um, some of the overarching and intersecting challenges because obviously, um, COVID-19 uh, does not impact the homelessness community in a bubble. There are already resource constraints, already challenges um, of um, housing availability and racial equity um, that we're all kind of facing and trying to address. Um, and this obviously makes that notably more complicated. Um, okay, I think w one thing I, I, I appreciated Joy's um, kind of introduction because in part I think we're gonna play a little bit of accidental good cop, bad cop. Um, I noticed kind of some of her comments around things like data collection, um, you know, said it's great. Like we, we have a lot of people that are collecting data and what you're gonna hear from me is a little bit of the opposite, which is, yeah, we have some people collecting data and it's good that they are, we can do better. Um, but let's move on, okay. So going through the methods for the part two for the second survey that was conducted um, during this during the summer and the methods were essentially the same. Um, this was another online survey um, in line with the first one. Surveys were sent out on July 16th to 861 unique email addresses connected to all 397 COCs. Um, we had about 50 bounce backs um, and NAH sent out two reminders um, to everyone to whom we'd sent an email and closed the survey after about two weeks um, on July 29th, 2020. Um, we got responses from 77 unique COCs. Um, and of them, we had a completion rate, I believe, of 59%. Um, one thing that I, I do want to, and, and those, serve, those 77 COCs represent um, between 19 and 20% of all COCs in the country. Um, one thing that I think is worth noting is some of the limitations um, of the survey and of this process. Um, it is 
not a random representative sample. And so we do need to be careful about how we interpret the results. Um, we do think these findings are incredibly valuable and meaningful, but we're not you know, sitting here performing statistical um, inference tests um, for a, a reason. Um, second, and this is true for both the first and the second surveys, is that we can't validate responses. Um, so there could be errors in the data that we're getting. Um, and you know, if there's some obvious problem, like someone says they have a million new beds, we can obviously kind of follow up with them. Um, but um, otherwise, it's hard to tell kind of, it, it, it's hard to, to kind of make uh, small, small ch other changes. Okay, moving on to kind of the substance of our findings. Um, so there is more screening and testing now or in late July than there was in May during the first iteration of the survey, but there is still a heavy reliance on symptom screening because of testing shortages. Uh, and this does not allay concerns around asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic infection and transmission. 83% of COC stated that all people in shelter um, are being screened, although there's definitely a variation in where in the shelter process that occurs. 29% of screening, 29% uh, are screening all people at coordinated entry sites, and 29 are also screening all people um, who are unsheltered. Um, unsheltered homelessness comes up as a group um, kind of oftentimes not receiving necessary resources, and that happens kind of throughout the survey. Um, moving to the testing, 75% are testing um, all or most symptomatic people, um, which to me is remarkable that there are still 25% of COCs that are not testing everyone who is symptomatic. Um, about four, and, and that's something I kind of learned, like to learn a little bit more about and hoping that we can get to in the, in the Q&A is what are the constraints around there. And I'm gonna guess that it relates to something that we'll hit on later on, which is there's just an, uh, a lack of availability of tests. 55% um, that said that they were testing at locations where homeless people uh, live or congregate, um, which I'm sure impacts accessibility because it means 45% are not doing that. Um, more than a quarter said they had untrained staff doing some of the screening at 75%. They said they, they had trained staff who are not medical professionals. Um, and about 40% said that they had medical professionals um, conducting the screening. So again, 60% um, are having people outside of the medical profession doing these symptom screening. Okay, um, now let's focus on the PPE crisis, um, which obviously expand, uh, extends beyond the world of homelessness, but certainly impacts our work. Um, so we asked about the availability of personal protection equipment for staff and consumers, and it's gonna come as no surprise that supply shortfalls were pretty common. Um, the most common being uh, masks for consumers at about a third, um, hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies each at about a quarter of CUC stating that they had shortages there. Um, one thing that, that, I mean, this is kind of my own interpretation of this, but there could be some bias here in the form of changed expectations. Um, so the people might have had higher expectations for what kind of resources they would have. Um, I mean, we had, uh, not just in, in May, but even in, in March or April, but as we kind of got I would argue kind of overly accustomed to the resource constraints that are, are facing the homelessness world and kind of the country in COVID-19 testing and uh, resources generally. Um, our, our expectations for what we should or could have um, have probably changed as a result. Um, right, 40% also stated that they had a shortage of COVID-19 tests or access to testing. But again, my guess is, is that, that that's a, a lower bound um, for what the what the actual shortage uh, could be. Um, and also, while there's only a 40% um, saying that they have an insufficient amount of COVID testing, um, there's also a limitation there in terms of how long it's taking to get results back. Because even if they're conducting all the tests they should conduct, um, if it's taking two weeks to get results back, obviously there are other problems uh, to deal with. Um, and those are generally uh, attributable to um, a lack of supplies and procurement delays, um, which is similar to what we saw in the, the first round in the spring. Okay, uh, now moving on to housing placements. More than 80% of responding COC stated that they had increased distancing um, to at least six feet between beds and procured new hotel and motel rooms. About a third had closed some shelters, opened new shelters to accommodate distancing efforts, um, and secure new permanent housing options. Um, and that's all for people in shelter. For people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, 
but three quarters are putting people into new hotel and motel rooms, um, open new emergency shelters and secured new housing. Um, one, of the, one of the more kind of common threads that we see when discussing unsheltered homelessness is encampments. Um, now, uh, some communities are sanctioning existing encampments. Um, and on the other side, a couple went the other way and are creating new encampments. Um, and it's worth kind of having these conversations in, in the context of the CDC guidance um, that, that's been around, I wanna say, since the end of March. Um, and also, it's generally older people and, pe and people with pre-existing medical conditions that are being prioritized for new housing options. Um, and about half said that unsheltered populations are also being prioritized for new housing options. Um, and again, a lot of this is along the same lines of what we saw in the spring. Okay, moving on to data collection. 76% uh, uh, of COCs are capturing data within HMIS, and that's a 17 point bump from May. Uh, three quarters or 74% are collect that are collecting data are doing so on people placed into isolation to prevent spread or uh, placed into quarantine. And about half are collecting data on sheltered people um, screening asymptomatic or on unsheltered people screening as, screening asymptomatic or unsheltered people that are testing positive. Um, and again, the flip side of this means that half of COCs are not recording these things, um, which, and, and this is of the group that is in fact collecting any data in, in HMIS. Um, and as um, right, someone that relies on data for my work, um, I find this a little bit concerning. Um, there could also be some uh, coordination concerns between homelessness and public health agencies. Um, those agencies um, that are often the ones conducting the testing may or, not, may, or may not be collecting housing status data um, and data sharing across uh, health and homelessness systems is notoriously limited. Okay, uh, let's talk about the strains that this places on system functioning. Um, about half of COCs said that they're experiencing staffing shortages, which to be honest is a lower rate than I would have expected. Um, of those that were, nearly all had shortages in frontline shelter staff, but about half also said that street outreach workers um, were, were a concern, um, and more than that stated that they had a shortage of volunteers as well. About a third also had shortages in their facilities management and maintenance teams, um, and, a, and this is kind of an often under-recognized problem because these are, and th this gets to conversations that expand beyond the homelessness world, but these are essential workers in any moment. And I would acknowledge that in, in, this, in these homelessness conversations and beyond, um, those people um, often don't have their actual kind of worth and value acknowledged. Um, and now with such a premium on frequent cleaning, they're more important than ever. And uh, these shortages have severe impacts on our ability to protect staff and clients at, at shelters. Um, and these shortages, the same as in the uh, first round, were also largely due to uh, quarantines and isolation requirements. Okay, and this is going to be my last slide because I want to make sure that we have uh, ample time for Q and A, of which I'm sure there are um, quite a few questions. Um, right, the and this is something that I alluded to earlier, and has been mentioned by Eric and Joy um, in their talks as well, uh, that the acute service needs relating to helping people experiencing homelessness through COVID-19 do not exist in a vacuum. Um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 are no secret and we're reading every day about um, an, an impending eviction crisis. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the analysis published by Dan O'Flaherty and Community Solutions projecting a point in time increase in homelessness of 40 to 45%. Um, and there's some data coming from this survey to suggest that that's beginning to emerge. 81% of COCs responded that they were already experiencing higher than average levels of requests for assistance. Um, and this occurs also uh, amidst a well-known gap in racial equity and housing instability and homelessness. Most COCs are developing racially uh, equitable approaches to permanent housing but a third of COCs that answered the survey do not have a plan to address those equity gaps. Um, and of course, the homeless service system is no stranger to resource limitations. I'm not gonna go kind of into the weeds here because they are well known to anyone who's, who's logging on here. Um, but this has obviously been exacerbated on both the supply side and the demand side um, in this moment. Um, all right, and now I'll kick it to uh, Jackie for a Q&A. All right, 
I'm going to start my video so you can see who's talking. And um, I'd like to open everything up for questions and answers. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box or in the uh, questions and answers box, and um, we will start answering questions for you. And let me just make sure I can get everybody's videos running. Um, but yeah, feel free to start uh, putting in your uh, um, questions and we will get to them in one second. Okay, uh, there we go. All right. So, um, Let's see. Somebody's got to have a question to get us started. There we go. Um, has anyone experienced a lack of housing options for COC vouchers? Is the first question we received. Let's see. And by all means, if people have this experience, like if they are in a COC where there are a lack of, of housing um, options and vouchers, you know, feel free to put it in the chat and, and you know, explain what's happened. Um, you can also put it in the questions box if you want us to, you know, share it on the video. Um, you know, you're welcome to communicate however works best for you. I'll also say um, the genesis for this project was um, for for us to listen to you. So if you want to share any thoughts about some of the issues that were raised or um, specifically some of the, the factors that were identified about the surveys and your personal experiences with them or the challenges we identified or, or um, to the promising practices, we, we think that that will be interesting for our discussion as well. So we got another question um, also asking about um, the recent storms that have come through and how are people being helped now. Um, and I would assume, you know, given that this is, you know, in the middle of a pandemic and dealing with, um, you know, natural disasters that definitely increases the pressure on the, uh, the COC and the community. Um, so I would love to hear uh, from the audience if if you have any experience with that and, and how you've been able to work through those crises. And let's see. Oh, and it looks like we also have a question in the chat about um, if there's a plan for um, uh, regionalizing anything for winter for homeless shelters, um, now that there are reductions in the capacity in, in shelters. And I'm curious if we've if we have anything from the um, the community interviews um, if anyone had mentioned anything about what they were planning to do for the winter. Um, I don't know if if that came up in um, uh, the research you did joy. Um, I, you know, given that it was, you know, spring and summer winter wasn't the most uh, obvious thing on everyone's mind. So yeah, but I will say that that is a good question. Um, what what people's plans are as we go into another season and definitely um, a, a colder season um, when they may have a shortage of, of shelter beds. Um, that's something that should be a part of a future <laughs> um, segment of this project. Um, so that is something that, that we should be asking um, as I noted at the beginning, we have done multiple parts of the series. We continue, we plan to continue um, reaching out to you and getting more information through, through surveys or through interviews and conversation. And that certainly is one of the things we'll want to know. Excellent. Uh, we have another question um, about uh, the White House announcing a four months, a four month extension on rental, uh, more, uh, rental eviction moratoriums. Um, what is the likelihood of this action actually helping individuals and families facing eviction? Any idea how long it would take for a policy like that to uh, take effect? Uh, 
I could say a lot of um, I, I think um, I think a lot of people are analyzing that at this point and, and uh, analyzing the details. Um, there has been a push from organizations like ours to do extensions of moratoriums, but oftentimes those are are paired. Excuse me, are paired with requests for rental assistance. Um, one of the one of the deficiencies of a moratorium is that the the amount of debt continues to build and over time and if you have folks who are who are out of work or or may have been living paycheck to paycheck before the crisis um the chances that they'll be able to make a balloon payment um at some point of, of multiple months of back rent is unlikely but um clearly um, moratoriums um, work to keep people housed now um, so there's some there's some pros and there's some cons and there's some question marks. Um, if anybody has questions about about the surveys um, or or the interviews or or wants to discuss the issues that were raised there, um, please please do so. So we have another question asking about um, where communities are getting the funding for the hotels and motel stays. Um, I think. It, in many cases, that's um, not only HUD uh, ESG dollars, but also uh, private foundation dollars, state dollars. So you know, there's multiple sources of funding, um, and it's it's different in each community, like the percentage of money coming from which source. Um, we did do some uh, evaluation of this uh, particular topic in the survey report. So um, you know, if you take a look at uh, our website. Um, which will be included when we send out uh, the slides. You'll you'll have a link to the uh, report, um, but you can see like what the various uh, sources of of new funding were for each, um, or you know the average sources of funding for each of the communities, and um, you know how they uh, were planning to prioritize those resources. All right. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, seeing the trends of how COCs utilized uh, hotels and motels and non-congregate shelter, do you see this moving forward as um, how services will look going forward instead of going back to the way they were? So I can, I can give a little bit of an answer. Um, Certainly, there is a, a big conversation going on about the future of congregate shelter um, in light of, of this uh, crisis. Um, certainly, there could be future phases of this crisis that make it difficult to have congregate shelter. And in general, the, the healthiness of it is, is something that we should all be thinking about. So I, I know that there are folks who want to move in that direction of non-congregate shelter. Um, there also are discussions about hotels and motels that we'll have to see how they develop. Um, there are some that may, may never come back, on, come back to life the way they um, existed previously. And so therefore potentially could be up for sale. And so there are people who are talking about and communities that are considering um, purchasing hotels that they've been using through um, the crisis and, and um, converting them into some forms of, of permanent housing or other types of um, temporary housing. I think that's a developing conversation. You'll definitely hear more from us on that. Some of our colleagues are, are continuing to research that and we want to continue to monitor um, the extent to which those those types of situations develop. Yeah, I mean, I, I can also chime in here more with kind of a, a general thought than with a prediction, because I'm at least smart enough to stay away from a prediction. But um, I mean, I think the homelessness field has been moving away from shelter generally, and I think kind of one of the lessons from the VA in the um, you know 2010 to 2016 era was the move toward prevention and rapid rehousing and permanent and permanent housing and away from you know things like transitional housing as the solution and right we've been moving more and more in that direction since 2009 um, this might accelerate that 
Um, but whether whether or not that actually come, comes to comes to fruition, um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to make that guess. And we've got a couple of questions that came in um, asking if we're going to continue doing surveys, um, if there's going to be a future round, and um, will we be doing that to build upon the, the data we currently have? I, I believe we are doing another round. Um, we don't know when yet, but um, there will be another round of surveys and we will be sending them out to the COC contacts. Um, so, you know, stay tuned and uh, you will definitely see something from us in the future. Yeah, I, I think some of, I think a, a big chunk of the value in here is understanding how the, the landscape and circumstances facing COCs is changing um, over time. And one thing that, you know, we can do, especially as we get another iteration or two, is kind of line that up with other policy interventions related to the economy and, and COVID-19 um, to see how, how things are going. Yeah, and I think that we're really lucky that people responded to us in such big numbers, especially early on, because we have, I mean, obviously we don't have a baseline per se, because before there was COVID, there was nothing to ask about COVID, but to get sort of that initial survey in late April, early May is, is, is a pretty quick response, because, and you can see through the answer, through some of the stuff that I was sharing that, you know, you could see that those early days issues were recorded there. And so it, I think it really is a nice opportunity if we can continue to do this over the next you know, months and, and, you know, year or so, it's, you know, a couple of times, a couple more times, it'd be very helpful for us to just kind of almost have a history of how, you know, the COCs responded to this crisis, you know, and, and the changes that, that it, that it engendered, um, and, and sort of, you know, and, and like Dan was showing just the resilience of the communities to respond to the crisis, you know, it's really, um, you know, pretty amazing stuff to see as a, as an academic who usually sits from the outside, look, you know, kind of, you know, looking looking in, it's it's it was really encouraging to see you know such such responses. Yeah, and and let me add again, I, I kind of play the, and I did a little bit dur during my talk. I kind of play the role of bad news bear sometimes. Um, but um, how grateful we are that so many COCs filled out each of these because it gives us you know a good a good sense of what's going on, um, and that gives us and particularly NAEH the tools to advocate for you know, more tools for data collection or more, more PPE or whatever it is. Um, but this is the only way that we can do that systematically. And we know that, you know, these surveys take time um, to answer in a period where nobody has time. Um, so for any, for any of you, you know, that have joined that filled this out, thank you, because that's, that's the only way that we can make the systematic uh, difference that, 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 that we need to get through this moment. Absolutely. Well, with that, we are at time. Um, it's actually a couple of minutes over, so I will let everyone enjoy the rest of their day. And we thank you all for attending the um, webinar. And if you participated in the survey, double thank you. And we will be in contact with all of you shortly and uh, hope to hear from you and see you on our next webinar that we do about the uh, uh, COVID surveys sometime in the future. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.